An NHK survey shows work is finished in less than 5% of the area near the Fukushima Daiichi plant designated for cleanup. Even after that work is done, radiation levels in many places have not fallen to the government standard. The town of Hirono is 30 kilometers south of the plant. Workers have almost finished decontaminating residential areas. The government's safe limit for radiation is 0.23 microsieverts per hour. It's 0 0.39. The radiation level is not falling. Residents are calling on authorities to decontaminate these areas once again. The radiation must drop to a level that we feel safe to live with. Otherwise, we can never rebuild this area. The workers wash down roads and roofs and scrape off the surface soil and gardens, but town officials and experts say it's difficult to remove radioactive substances from the tiny gaps in asphalt. It's hard physical labor and takes a lot of time. Heavy snow hampers the work in winter. Sometimes the homeowners have evacuated and officials can't contact them. It's also difficult to find a place to temporarily store the contaminated soil. One expert suggests it's time to review the cleanup plan. Radiation levels over the long term are expected to drop below the standard only in some of the areas. In the high-level areas, officials should allow the residents the option of moving out. Officials in the central government say they will re-examine the decontamination plan later this year. Japanese and American scientists are sailing off the coast of Fukushima in Japan and studying the sea. They're checking whether radioactive material from the nuclear disaster two years ago is still affecting the ocean. NHK World's Yoichiro Tateiwa reports from on board the research vessel Umita Kamaru. The team of scientists sailed out of Tokyo on Monday. They will spend 10 days testing the waters of northeastern Japan. On Friday, they approached to about 5 kilometers of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The team members are collecting water and marine species from various depths and taking soil from the seabed. They are aiming to find out whether the release of radioactive materials is still affecting the environment and whether there have been any further leaks. Ken Butler leads the Americans on the team. He says they want to shed light on the medium and long-term effects of the accident using the technologies of both the U.S. and Japan. The scientists will be taking samples at a various locations until next Thursday in hopes of getting answers. Yoichiro Tateiwa, NHK World, off the coast of Fukushima. Hydrogen explosion two years ago at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant damaged the building housing the number one reactor. The plant's operator covered the building with a temporary structure. Now officials plan to remove the structure in order to take out a spent fuel. Tokyo Electric Power Company officials plan to start the process this winter that will allow workers to clear blast debris from the upper floor of the reactor and set up equipment to remove the fuel. Workers will spray chemicals on the building to prevent radioactive material from getting into the air. Officials say the amount of radioactive material being released is now less than one one-hundredth of the amount measured before the structure was installed. They say there will be little impact on the environment after it is removed. Company officials say they will install a new enclosure in four years. Experts at Japan's nuclear watchdog are trying to answer some of the questions that remain about the 2011 nuclear accident in Fukushima. They plan to incorporate their findings into new safety standards for nuclear plants. Nuclear Regulation Authority staff held an initial meeting with outside experts. Their inquiry follows investigations by the government, the Diet, and plant operator Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO. Their probe will look at the impact of the earthquake on Fukushima Daiichi, how fuel rods melted, and how radioactive material made it into the environment. 
The panel is also trying to find out why water leaked in the Reactor 1 building immediately after the quake. TEPCO engineers said water from a spent fuel pool trickled down through the reactor's cooling system. The experts want to study whether the quake disabled the system or if pressure from the leaked water was to blame. They're aiming to nail down as many facts as possible within this investigation, which will include on-site surveys, but they won't be able to see everything they want because radiation levels in many parts of the plant are still dangerously high. Tokyo Electric Power Company could be considered one of the most criticized firms in Japan. It runs a damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Since the accident there, TEPCO managers have earned a reputation for putting profit before safety and withholding key information. But they're trying to change their corporate culture by reaching out to foreign experts. NHK World's Yoshiro Tateiwa sat down with a member of their nuclear reform monitoring committee. Please come in. Lady Baba Judge nice is a former chairman of the UK Atomic Energy Authority. She's an expert in corporate crisis management. Uh, TEPCO has asked her to help reform their corporate culture. My specific task has been to help them set up a, a safety organization, a safety oversight organization within TEPCO, which will establish a new safety culture. Judge took up her role last September. She's seen a string of problems at Fukushima Daiichi since then. The power for the cooling system has failed twice, and workers have found contaminated water leaking on several occasions. Each time trouble occurred, TEPCO came under fire. Critics said the company was slow to disclose fact. Judge says it will take time to change but they're on the right track. TEPCO is now bringing in outsiders, asking them to look and see what's going on and to tell TEPCO the good things and the problems. And I think this fact of opening the doors and letting foreigners and outside experts come in shows that TEPCO wants to know what its problems are to the extent it can't identify them themselves and they want advice and they're looking for help. And that's the first step towards fixing things, recognizing the problems and opening the doors for help. Judge says TEPCO should disclose information swiftly, even if the full picture isn't clear. She says explaining risk without delay is the only way to win public confidence. You can't know the whole truth immediately. You have to only know half the truth. So we used to wait till we knew everything. Now we have to keep talking. And that the Japanese and the rest of the world are going to have to learn how to get on the television or on the computer and say, this is what we know now. It may be this or it may not be this. This is just what we know now. It may change. Judge says the nuclear industry as a whole will have to open their doors and become more international. She says there will be global solutions in future and full disclosure is the only way forward. The head of the agency that operates the Monju Fast Breather Reactor has resigned. Officials at the Nuclear Authority said his organization had failed to carry out safety checks. Science and Technology Minister Hakobun Shimomura announced that Atsuyuki Suzuki will step down as president of the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, or JAEA. Shimomura said the operator's lax oversight was a breach of public trust. Suzuki became president of JAEA in August 2010. He was a member of the Nuclear Safety Commission from 2001 to 2010 and became its chief in 2006. 
Government inspectors found JAA failed to conduct more than 9,800 equipment inspections at the Munju reactor in central Japan last year. Shimomura said the ministry will select a successor. He pledged to work to regain public confidence. Now, Japanese leaders envisioned a future where they could sustain the country's energy needs with recycled fuel. They built Mongju as a dream reactor that would generate more fuel than it consumed. Engineers started developing this type of reactor with the birth of Japan's nuclear program in the 1960s. Government leaders hoped to put the facility online by the early 1990s, but things didn't go according to plan. They pushed the deadline back each time they reviewed their nuclear policy. Finally, in 1994, the operator fired up the reactor. The following year, a sodium leak brought operations to a halt, and workers there continued to face problems. The operator put the facility back online in 2010, but during a test run, a fuel exchanger fell into the reactor vessel, and again the plant went offline. The people at Japan Atomic Energy Agency want to restart before next April. But regulators say the operator is unable to ensure the safety of the reactor. They've ordered workers to stop preparations to restart it. The government has spent more than 18 billion dollars on the facility, but government officials believe Monju won't be able to resume full-scale operations until around 2050. Nuclear authorities are dealing with safety problems at another offline plant. The Monju fast breeder reactor is just three kilometers down the road from Tsuruga. Officials say the operator has failed to carry out safety checks. As a result, they are demanding that plants to, plans to restart the reactor be put on hold. Government officials inspected the Monju reactor last year. They found more than 9,800 missed checkups on equipment. The plant operator, Japan Atomic Energy Agency, later filed a report promising to improve safety procedures. But officials say the operator has yet to improve the situation. Meeting on Wednesday, the nuclear watchdog issued a harsh reprimand. <laughs> The real problem is that organizations like the Atomic Energy Agency still exist and are allowed to exist. NRA officials told the operator not to prepare for restarting the reactor until they can confirm the situation has improved. The officials say they will allow the Monju operator to respond before formally issuing the order. This, was likely, this will likely delay delay the reactor's restart until the end of next March. The expert panel of Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority has confirmed the ground beneath the power plant is unstable. Panel members say a reactor on the Sea of Japan coast sits on an active fault, and they say it's at risk should an earthquake strike. NHK World's Takafumi Terui reports. The experts reached their conclusion at a meeting on Wednesday. The findings wrap up their seismological study on the Tsuruga plant. The question is whether the newly found fault is active or not. In the final analysis, we conclude that it's an active one. Governance guidelines ban plant operators from building reactors directly above active faults. That means if the panel's findings are upheld, the reactor could be shut down for good. The plant is currently offline. Nuclear Regulation Authority commissioners say they will decide their next step on the reactor as early as next week. Local reactions were mixed. If there's any possibility the reactor sits on an active fault, we shouldn't let it run. The reactor should be decommissioned at once. That would be good for our children. Many people work at the power plant. The reactors should be allowed to run. <laughs> Tsuruga city mayor Kazuharu Kawase questions the findings. He said experts with wider backgrounds should be involved. Nuclear energy has been promoted in line with state policy. If the reactor is to be shut down, the government should show us an alternative way to support our economy.
plant operator also criticized the expert's conclusion. A vice president of Japan Atomic Power Company has protested to the NRA. The report is not based on scientific or technological data. Far from it. We have lodged a complaint. We hope they review the content. The operator says it will conclude its own survey into the fault by June. Panel members say they may review the report if the operator comes up with new findings. NRA commissioners stress they make decisions based on scientific evidence. But critics point out they will need to explain in more detail how they reach their conclusions if they are to rebuild trust in the country's nuclear policy. Takahumi Terui, NHK World. Experts on disaster prevention are outlining what could happen if the so-called Nankai Trough quake strikes Japan. They say it is possible high-rise buildings in Tokyo could sway back and forth for more than 20 minutes. The Nankai Trough is a subduction zone where one plate descends below the edge of another. It stretches for 900 kilometers off the coast of central to western Japan. The government asked disaster prevention experts to look at how the Nankai Trough quake could affect high-rise buildings. The experts found that in the worst-case scenario, the surface of the ground would shake more than 10 minutes in Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya. The swaying or oscillation of buildings would be most pronounced at the top of high rises. Professor Yoshiaki Hisada of Kogaku University in Tokyo used the analysis to run his own oscillation test. He chose a 29-story building on his campus. He used computer modeling to reproduce its structure. He discovered that the highest part of the building would shake nearly three meters from side to side about three minutes after the quake. He found that the building's oscillation could last more than 20 minutes and could be nearly five times larger than the sway caused by the 2011 earthquake. Worse, the force could warp the joints of poles and cross beams more than expected, possibly causing walls and ceilings to collapse. We now know the possible effects of the Nankai Trough quake. We need to strengthen the structure of buildings, especially tall ones, even though it will cost a lot. Professor Hisada says the quake wouldn't cause buildings to collapse, but he says shelves should be fixed to prevent injuries from long period oscillation. An unusually large number of sea lion pups have been found on shore in Southern California. Experts suspect shortages of food in their habitat. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says 948 sea lions were rescued from January to March in Los Angeles and its vicinity. Most of them were younger than one year old and malnourished. In the average year, about 80 sea lion pups, which have not been able to feed themselves, are rescued in the first three months in the region. Saved sea lions are transported to aquariums and other facilities for rehabilitation, but they're full this year. Experts say the number of fish that sea lions feed on may be declining. What comes close is the 1980s where we had El Nino, uh, where the waters were warmer, and that explained why there was a lack of food. But now the water is cold and there's no explanation of why there's no food for the sea lions. Japanese police have deployed vehicles in Tokyo and Fukushima that are radiation-proof. They say the cars will protect them in the event of a terrorist attack on a nuclear plant. Officers with the National Police Agency say the two cars are protected by lead shields. Engineers pressurized the interiors to prevent radioactive substances from being drawn in, and the vehicles are equipped with sensors to monitor radiation levels. The cost? 1.5 million dollars. Officers say they'll mobilize the cars in the event of a nuclear accident or a terrorist attack. They say the cars will protect them from radiation while they try to help residents or look for terrorists. Officers say the accident in Fukushima two years ago made them more aware of the possibility of attacks on nuclear facilities. Farmers from a town evacuated in the wake of the Fukushima nuclear crisis are heading for the rice paddies once again. They're preparing to plant their first crop in three years, and authorities are hoping this will help revive the local economy. 
An agricultural company in the town of Hirono started planting rice seeds in nurseries on Monday. Authorities plant rice on an experimental basis last year, and they were able to confirm that radiation levels remain below government regulations. Farmers will start transferring the rice plants from the nurseries to the paddies in early May. We've been waiting for this moment for a long time. Growing rice again means getting our hometown back. We want to show that to everyone. More than 5,000 residents evacuated the town after the nuclear accident. Only 10% of them have returned. Japanese police and the Coast Guard have conducted a large-scale anti-terrorism drill at a nuclear power plant in Fukushima. About 150 personnel participated in the drill at the Fukushima Daini plant. The plant is about 10 kilometers from the Daiichi facility crippled in the 2011 disaster. The exercise was based on the scenario that terrorists were attacking the plant. The participating groups included a spe special uh, police attack team and Coast Guard anti-terrorism forces. <laughs> In the scenario, terrorists tried to approach the nuclear plant from the sea. The Coast Guard seized their boat and arrested them. Police forces exchanged fire with terrorists who used a car to burst through the front gate of the plant. Officers wearing radiation suits captured the assailants. National police agency officials say the possibility of terrorists targeting nuclear plants has increased following the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Police and other security organizations plan to continue working together to prepare for such attacks. A French energy company has sent nuclear fuel to Japan for the first time since the disaster in Fukushima two years ago. Protesters fear the shipment signals Japanese utilities may restart some more reactors. A ship left port in Cherbourg, France under tight security. It's carrying mixed oxide fuel, or MOX, a blend of plutonium and uranium. The French energy group Areva is delivering the shipment to Kansai Electric Power Company. The people who run Kansai Electric plan to use the fuel at their Takahama plant in central Japan. But the complex, like most nuclear facilities in the country, is currently offline. Dozens of activists from Greenpeace staged a protest on Monday before the ship left port. They say the fuel is extremely dangerous. Areva officials say the shipment will arrive in Japan in about two months. Officials from the White House have released a national strategy for the Arctic. The policy paper suggests proactively setting rules for the development of the area around the Arctic Sea. President Barack Obama on Friday signed the policy. It calls the Arctic the last frontier. The strategy notes global warming is causing Arctic ice to melt. This environmental change has resulted in the opening of new sea routes and the possibility of mining resources from the sea bottom. In this way, the Arctic has become more important than before. The strategy says the U.S. aims to secure freedom of navigation within the Arctic Circle. It adds the U.S. will engage in making rules for the development of the area. The paper notes natural resources in the area need to be preserved and maintained. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is scheduled to attend a ministerial conference of eight northern nations opening in Sweden on Wednesday. Experts say the U.S. officials timed the release of the paper to state the country's position ahead of the conference. A Japanese official will attend the meeting, which will decide the countries to take part in the official policymaking. <laughs> I will fully explain to the eight northern nations about Japan's policy in the Arctic area. Northeast Asian countries, including Japan, China and South Korea, have asked to be allowed to observe the future policy process. Energy developers are increasingly curious about what lies beneath the Arctic Ocean. Researchers with the U.S. Geological Survey say the continental shelf may hold undiscovered crude oil and natural gas, but development of the area remains largely unregulated. Ministers from eight Arctic nations are trying to change that. Members of the Arctic Council met in Kiruna, Sweden. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov were among those trying to set rules for developing the ocean. 
They want to protect the marine environment from being polluted. The ministers also granted observer status on the council to six countries, including Japan, China, and South Korea. Government leaders from the two countries want to have a say in how Arctic resources are used. Japanese researchers say they've successfully killed off cells that cause a type of leukemia common in adults. They say the discovery brings medical science a step closer to a cure. Scientists at Riken Research Center in Yokohama are working to develop treatment for acute myelogenous leukemia. They're focusing on leukemia stem cells. They say those cells produce cancerous ones and lead to relapses. They identified a compound that can be tightly bound to a protein related to the spread of the stem cells. And they say that could limit cells from multiplying. The researchers transplanted human leukemia stem cells into mice, giving them the disease. Then, the scientists gave them daily doses of the compound. The researchers found that within about two months, the stem cells had died out in the blood and bone marrow where blood cells are produced. First, we have to make sure the drug is safe. Then, we're going to apply it to leukemia patients as soon as possible. More than 5,000 people develop acute myelogenous leukemia in Japan every year. About 30% of them suffer frequent relapses. Congratulations, you've somehow managed to stay alive this far into this web video. It's been over two years since the Fukushima nuclear disaster, but a second crisis may be on its way sooner than you think. I'll tell you why in tonight's Daily Take. Since the Fukushima nuclear disaster first began back in March of 2011, there have been near daily updates on the condition of that stricken plant. Update dates which have been getting worse and worse, painting a very dire scene at the Daiichi nuclear power plant. From the moment the earthquake and the tsunami devastated the plant, officials have been struggling to contain the levels of radioactive waste, fuel, and cooling water. In February, for example, officials discovered a fish in a nearby water intake station for the plant that contained more than 7,400 times the recommended safe limit of radioactive cesium. And now, officials are concerned that because of all the leaks, power outages, and glitches that have occurred, the Daiichi nuclear power plant could begin to break apart and cause an even worse nuclear disaster when the decades-long cleanup process finally begins. But despite all the chaos in Japan and the continued fears of more nuclear disasters down the road, here in the United States, we're still relying heavily on nuclear power. And to make matters worse, there are 23 General Electric Mark I nuclear reactors across our country, the same kind of nuclear power plants that failed so miserably at Fukushima. These Mark I reactors are located all across America, from Vermont to Minnesota to New York to Nebraska. If just one of these reactors were to fail on the level of the Fukushima Daiichi uh, Mark, Mark I reactor, it would be an unprecedented disaster. But don't tell that to government officials, lawmakers, or nuclear power proponents who continually argue that not only is nuclear power one of the safest forms of energy, but it's also one of the cleanest and greenest forms of energy. Events like Fukushima, Chernobyl, and Three Mile Island disprove the safety claims about nuclear power pretty well, but what about the claims that it's one of the cleanest and greenest forms of energy out there? Proponents of nuclear power love to claim that nuclear power is a carbon-free solution to climate change. Even Obama's new energy secretary has said so. Nuclear power lobbyists claim that the production of energy via nuclear power doesn't emit any CO2, and as a result, it's one of the cleanest forms of energy out there. It's nonsense. There's nothing clean, carbon-wise, about nuclear nuclear power. And the only thing green about it is the glowing radioactivity. When nuclear power advocates argue that it's a carbon-free form of energy, they're failing to realize that whenever a power plant is built, whether it's a solar plant, a wind plant, or a nuclear plant, it's always CO2 emitted. But you're making the stuff that makes the plant. Every form of energy production produces some amount of carbon dioxide. In order to accurately calculate just how much CO2 is produced, from the power plant, you have to look at the entire life cycle of the plant as well as the production of the raw materials that produce the energy that it produces. With nuclear power, for example, that means looking at the construction of the plant, the operation of the plant, the maintenance and refurbishing efforts, and the decommissioning and dismantling of the plant's nuclear reactor. And you must look at the nuclear fuel used 
and the process for mining, refining, and transporting it. Jan Wilhelm Storm Van Leeuwen and Philip Smith, nuclear energy consultants at Sea Data Consultancy in the Netherlands, carried out life cycle analyses of nuclear power plants and found on average they produce anywhere from 90 to 140 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity. By comparison, solar power, wind power, and hydroelectric produce anywhere from 10 to 40 grams of CO2 per kilowatt of electricity, while gas-burning power plants emit 330 to 360 grams of CO2. In other words, nuclear energy does produce carbon dioxide, and it certainly isn't the solution to curbing the devastating effects of global warming and climate change. It's less than gas, oil, or coal, but far, far more than solar. The fact that government officials in Japan are continuing to struggle with the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plants more than two years after they initially failed should be all the proof needed that nuclear power is far too volatile a form of energy to safely rely on. All the myths about nuclear power have been debunked. It's time to shut down reactors and put an end to nuclear power worldwide. And let's start that process right now, right here in the U.S. No nukes. And that's the way it is tonight, Wednesday, May 1st, 2013. And don't forget, democracy begins with you. Get out there, get active, tag, you're it. Japan has concluded a deal with the United Arab Emirates that allows it to export nuclear power technology to the eastern, uh, Middle Eastern country. It's the first such agreement since the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is visiting the Persian Gulf state on the third leg of a week-long overseas trip. Abe conveyed Japan's plan to hold ministerial-level strategic talks on a regular basis with six Gulf Arab states known as the Gulf Cooperation Council. He also called for the start of working-level discussions with the UAE toward an investment agreement. UAE's expectation for Japan is very high because they think Japan has the best nuclear technology and very strict safety regulations after experiencing the severe accident. Therefore, Japan should meet their expectations. UAE Vice President Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum replied his country wants to work with Japan in various energy fields and serve as a gateway for it to the Middle East and North Africa. The two leaders concluded the nuclear deal. They also agreed to promote bilateral investments and economic exchanges. Japan and the United Arab Emirates have agreed to launch talks between senior officials to discuss protecting maritime sea routes and other security issues. Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe met Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nanyan, on Wednesday. Abe is in the UAE following his trip to Russia and Saudi Arabia. This is my first visit here as Prime Minister in six years. I'm glad to see you again. Abe proposed the security dialogue between senior foreign affairs and defense officials of the two countries. The Crown Prince agreed. The UAE is Japan's second largest oil exporter and protecting sea lanes is a key issue. Abe thanked the UAE for its stable oil supply. He said Japan can provide technology in energy saving and renewable energy. We bring new friends to play. Hi. Show how much you care. I wrote this just for you. We make you smile, Gee.